thank you, Walter, for the generous introduction. I'd also like to thank my co-author, who is uh, can't be here today. She is the Bertha Cape and Reynolds Professor at the Silverman School of Social Work at Hunter College in New York City, and that's part of the city university system. Uh, she is um, a, I believe she's a sociologist by training. Um, she is a social welfare historian. Primarily, most of her work is uh, looking at changes in social policy from a feminist perspective. Um, uh, we have been working on this for two years, um, and it's, I think, wrapping up. Uh, but as with any collaboration, there are some things I simply can't answer. Uh, but I'll do my best. Uh, the basic structure of what I'll present, uh, first I'll go over, um, you know, what was this shift in the political economy from the uh, liberal welfare state to the neoliberal or contraction of the welfare state. Explain what those mean. I, I, I see some people are not, might not be as familiar with these social policy shifts. I'll talk about residential segregation briefly and the measure that I'm using. Um, the basic question is, is what dimensions of segregation changed in the neoliberal period. Uh, but the purpose of that is um, to show how broadly, broad changes in social policy shape uh, how people sort into neighborhoods. Um, this is not, uh, even though I'm presenting data, it, uh, it's not, um, it, it's not a, uh, necessarily a narrow or reductionist causal argument. It's, I'll be presenting various kinds of, of evidence um, to draw a conclusion about where policy is going and how that impacts people and maybe what we should do about it. Um, so that's the, that's the basic idea. Um, so wh where are we now in the uh, world today? Uh, we live in a, or we're currently in a city that has been experiencing uh, substantial foreclosures, but at the same time was able to finance uh, a complete replacement of streetlights. Uh, it's a bit of a paradox. Uh, and I, I thought that that's a good place to open is that um, capital is not available to keep people in their homes. It is available <laughs> to replace streetlights. And why is that? Um, and <coughs> certain kinds of social welfare historians, um, alternative economists, talk about different shifts or phases in history. Um, and broadly speaking, um, in the paper we, we talk about three periods. I'm just going to go over two. Um, the current period, often called the neoliberal period, and then some people are wondering if we're in a new period or starting a new period. Uh, but the period uh, prior to that, between around 1935 and 1975, um, called the liberal period, uh, or the rise of the welfare state. And so that was characterized by the New Deal, the United States having an aggressive, progressive income tax. Um, there was an expanded federal role. Uh, prior, uh, social policy was primarily, if not exclusively, the domain of the states. And not only that, sometimes the townships, municipalities. Uh, so the federal government suddenly became involved in consumption policy, education policy. Uh, the Social Security Administration was created. Um, there were supplemental wage programs. Uh, we also saw the rise of organized labor and other social movements. The, the Civil Rights Movement was during this phase. And, for the social workers in the room, that was when social work became a quote-unquote profession. Um, in my lifetime, uh, I've been growing up in the neoliberal period. Neo in the sense of new, 
uh, liberal in the sense of free markets, not liberal in the sense of I, I can wear, I can go topless on the beach or any of those sort of social mores. Uh, although that, you know, they're related, perhaps. Um, so this period um, is characterized by cutting taxes. So instead of having a progressive income tax, we start to see more regressive <coughs> income taxes, which means the poor pay more as a uh, proportion of their salary than, than other, uh, otherwise. Uh, you see privatization of social services and educational services. You see the devolution of authority back to states through deregulation. Deregulation of industry, the weakening of social movements. Um, so for example, labor union uh, participation has fallen uh, in my lifetime. Discussions about family values and the need to restore them. Uh, and uh, undoing of some civil rights protection. Uh, recently we saw that with uh, changes, uh, court rulings on the Voting Rights Act, for example. And like I said before, some people are wondering, are we starting a new era? Um, now, why do we have these shifts? Uh, so there's a theory in sociology, alternative economics, called the social structure of accumulation, I'm not convinced it's a theory in the, the middle ground theory sense. Maybe it's more of a framework, but the, I, the intuition behind it uh, is clear and makes sense. The idea is that in order for a capitalist market economy to work, you need some kind of institutional structure. Um, whether that's courts, regulations, you need some sort of tax structure, you need some kind of institution that sets the rules of the game. Um, in this theory, it assumes the capitalists want the institutional structure to guarantee them high profits. Really. In other words, they want the institutions to work for them. Um, and that profit-maximizing institutional structure is called the social structure of accumulation, meaning the accumulation to holders of capital. In other words, the investor class. Uh, but higher profits drive up wages, costs, and competition. Um, and this leads to what's called a crisis of capital. And so what was the crisis of capital in 1935? Well, that was the, there was a huge stock market crash in 1929. Uh, but the ripple effects of that was what triggered the New Deal. And likewise, around 1967, there was a uh, large stock market crash and the ripple effects of that, including the oil crisis, stagflation, if anyone's old enough to remember that, remember stagflation, um, that triggered a crisis of capital that led to a, a broad change in the institutional structures. And that was why we had these shifts in social policy, according to this framework. Um, it was ways to make it easier for um, the investor class to have more profits. So what does this have to do with segregation? That was our question. Uh, uh, my co-author had written books about social policy and she had started to dialogue with scholars who had been writing about social structure of accumulation. Uh, now those authors in sociology and economics, they're not necessarily writing about social policy. Uh, they're writing about tax structure, stock markets, capital investments, and some also write about labor markets. Um, we started to wonder, uh, in part because the reason uh, we're collaborating is um, her uh, doctoral student, Amy Castro Baker, had, had um, done her dissertation on housing foreclosures. And we had got to be friends because we were both working on housing issues. Uh, and we wondered, you know, does segregation have something to do with the social structure of accumulation? So what is, why do we have segregation? Well, we know historically there are local ordinances that were segregationist. Uh, there were restrictive covenants on deeds that said you could only sell certain property homes to certain people of certain races. Uh, or, or you couldn't sell to people of certain races, rather. Um, 
at the federal and regulatory level, there were processes of redlining. So this, um, this map is actually based on uh, federal guidance on where uh, banks could lend if they wanted federal insurance. The red is where the redlining came from. And you can see that's a big chunk of Detroit. And does anyone know offhand what year that map is from? 1939? Yeah, that's about the right time. Uh, and I, I like to say that, so if, if anyone wants to blame Coleman Young for that, I believe he was, uh, he might have just hit puberty, but, um, you know, Coleman Young didn't cause redlining. Uh, so another thing about uh, segregation, uh, one question in the literature, uh, cities, uh, you know, between World War I and World War II had this rapid expansion. Some of that was driven by the, at least for northern cities, driven by the Great Migration uh, from uh, persons who had worked in agriculture, uh, both African American and white um, sharecroppers migrating to uh, industrial jobs in the north. Um, and sociologists look at segregation, um, the place stratification, the basic idea by that is the institutions that produce segregation are so strong that pretty much, you know, this process is a given, like it's going to continue through history. Um, then there's weak place stratification, sometimes called spatial assimilation. And, you know, the, the reason that theory got modified is there has been some integration. And the way that, how that theory was modified, um, the idea is uh, assimilation or the movement of African Americans, people of color, immigrants to privileged white spaces can happen at a price. So there's a price premium, uh, maybe a social premium. So you, there would be, ex, there would be, uh, and studies have shown that, yes, uh, uh, African American in an equivalent home in a majority white suburb, suburb is usually paying a higher price for the home, controlling for all the attributes of the home. Um, so that's some of the mechanisms behind segregation. And we're going to look and think about ways this might be shaped in the context of a social structure of accumulation. Um, this is an idea of, just visually so you can see, the sending <coughs> states and the receiving states. Uh, and we use that as a sampling frame. Um, OK. So I, we're only going to look at, uh, sociologists and geographers look at many different measures for segregation. Um, some look at how uneven um, neighborhoods look. And the basic idea there, if you wanted an even distribution of, um, let's say, African American and white across a metropolitan area, how many people would have to move from place A to place B? Uh, I'm not going to use that. Uh, partially, it's a little, it's not very intuitive, and it also ha is subject to more measurement error. Um, I won't get into this, this, was, this is very esoteric, uh, but the one we used is isolation. That's typically used in health research, um, and the idea here is the probability that a group in a neighborhood will interact only with members of their group. So you can intuitively interpret it as a percentage. Um, so if, if the target population is African American and you see 100%, uh, that would mean that on average, a person in that neighborhood, an African American in that neighborhood, would only interact with other African Americans. Um, uh, so. That's, that's, that's the measure. And why? Well, it, it has slightly better, uh, it has, it's less subject to measurement error, and it actually has, there has been a literature demonstrating its health outcomes. Uh, people, 
are healthier in less segregated environments, generally. There are exceptions. So we use data. Um, John Logan at Brown University has assembled census data all the way going back to 1940 to 2010. And he's calculated many of the segregation indices, so it's easy to download. Uh, I do have to warn you, I, I'm calculating the isolation index for a county based on neighborhoods within a county. Uh, and that's because city boundaries actually change quite a bit over the time period, but county boundaries don't, or at least not in these cities. Uh, so you'll see, uh, Mary was very insistent, you know, people aren't going to know what Cuyahoga County is. You know, just put the city name, right? We know it's a county, we'll footnote it or something. So you'll see the name of the city, but it's really the number for the county. Uh, uh, so uh, we picked the cities that, northern cities that experienced the highest levels of migration of African Americans from southern. Uh, we did the top 20. Um, and uh, Massey and Denton and Hajnal, um, they argue that if the segregation index, whether it's isolation to similarity, goes above 60, they call that hypersegregated. So that's their threshold where they think, hey, this is, this is a serious amount of segregation. All right, so here we go. Now, I didn't realize this is a small font. This is like a presentation faux pas, but all you really need to do is look um, at the broad trends. Um, so this line here is 1975. Um, and then I got Philadelphia, Chicago, Manhattan, St. Louis, Cincinnati. Here's our beloved Detroit, uh, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Indianapolis, Brooklyn. Um, black is African American. Um, orange is white. So just glancing at it, what do you notice about the orange white? Yeah, it's, go it's going down, right? Yeah, so it's going from high 90s to maybe around 75 on average. Uh, black, what's the trend there? Going up. Uh, let's look at the next 20. Now, I don't want to short change. Um, we also have uh, Latinos or Hispanics as referred to in the census in the blue. And you see there is a clear pattern there. Uh, and then Asian um, as classified by the census in the red. Pattern not quite as obvious. Um, and that's going up. So here's the next 20. Uh, Newark, Los Angeles, Columbus, Kansas City, East St. Louis. New Jersey, Chester, Pennsylvania, which is a Philadelphia suburb that is predominantly African American, Kansas City, Boston, and Akron, Ohio. Uh, so you see a um, similar pattern, um, but slightly more plateauing on the African American. So I pop them all on the same slide. And then you get do a smoothed average, and then you see kind of a U shape, more of a tra more of a plateau because the data point here is still higher than it was in 1940. So for African Americans in these cities, are more segregated today than in 1940. Uh, for Latinos, much more segregated today than in 1940. Uh, whites are less segregated. Um, and Asian, about uh, slightly more segregated, uh, but much less than any other uh, census classified ethnic group. All right, so that's what I just said. Um, now I do, as a limitation, those who study race and ethnicity, uh, this is an institutionally shaped identity. It doesn't have a biological basis per se, and it does mask meaningful within group differences. Um, you know, so, yes, we see a stark pattern. There's variation within those. 
Um, there are scholars who will calculate segregation for different ancestry groups to do a drill down, and other scholars would reject this line of research altogether uh, from the perspective that what this masks is too much, uh, and that doing this line of research only then reifies an artificial construct. I'm very sympathetic to those arguments, um, uh, but I think given the documented relationship um, on health outcomes, socioeconomic health outcomes, um, you know, it's important still to talk about and raise policy issues. Uh, there are also, you know, what the census calls your neighborhood is probably not what you call your neighborhood. I'll just say that. And that's the problem ever working with these administrative data sets. So, what does this mean conceptually? So, uh, Segregation increases, and then it plateaus. Um, we think of the Great Migration. If we think of what, where was migration in the neoliberal period, it's actually, you know, there was my more. You know, Michigan has a, been a population losing state, right? So there's been a migration to the Sun Belt, and then you have cities very interested in immigration. Um, so the, the, the salient migration in the neoliberal period is more of this uh, north to south migration, also international migration into cities. Um, there, we also thought, well, what kind of housing policy changes? And the broad brush stroke of how housing policy changed prior to the welfare state, um, Housing policy was the domain of states and cities. So at best, there was some reform around tenements, uh, around sanitation, things like, oh, we should have municipal garbage collection, uh, maybe rent control in some cities. And that was the extent of housing policy. With the welfare state, we have got, for the first time, public housing. So federally funded and constructed housing uh, for workers. Um, uh, they were segregated. Uh, we also had the subsid subsidy of suburbanization through the federal investment in highways, but also mortgage programs uh, like the GI Bill. Um, so some of the suburbs were set up as white only, right? So uh, people getting a GI Bill who were white could go take that to the suburb, but if you were not, then, you know, you had to remain in a uh, city. Uh, for the cities, there was a program, um, it was a predecessor of HUD, the Urban Renewal Agency and Program, and that funded um, slum and blight removal, and those who are Detroiters know, Paradise Valley, uh, Hastings Street, uh, for the building of 375, that was one of the major projects here. Um, so. You know, the idea, it was, you know, it's not a participatory exercise. It was purely technocratic. Um, you know, City Hall, Washington, deciding what neighborhoods would be completely removed and replaced with new structures. On the um, mortgage market side, there was an innovation that government should shoulder the risk of mortgages to make mortgages more available to workers. Um, and that clearly is part of the social structure of accumulation, right? Because you're just basically saying, OK, we, the government, we will shoulder some of the risk by insuring your mortgages. So if your uh, mortgagee defaults, we'll pay for the, the difference. Um, and that was through the rise of um, the Federal Housing Administration Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. Now, things changed in the 70s in terms of housing policy. There is a shift more from public housing to vouchers. So instead of building apartment towers that were run by a, a public housing authority, instead the public housing authority would give a family a voucher. Uh, and then they would find a private landlord to lease from. Um, there are a mix, actually. Some of the vouchers are actually um, 
place-based and they're administered by public housing authorities. Um, some of these urban renewal programs, they were block granted, so they were devolved to the states. And then a very similar thing happened with um, welfare reform, and that conversation is still happening. We're talking about block granting Medicaid, we're talking about block granting food stamps. Um, another change in housing policy, the low income housing tax credit, who's heard of that? So those of you who haven't heard of that, um, the, one of the, the biggest federal outlays for housing construction is through a tax credit. So who do you think gets the tax credit in the low income housing tax credit? Does anyone want to guess? The, the people who don't know. Yeah. The developer. Huh? The developer. Oh, close. Close. Good guess. I, I was trying to trick him to say, oh, it's the low income person. They get a tax credit for it. No. <laughs> um, so it's to the investor. So the investor could be a developer, but usually the developer sells the tax credit to the investor, usually a bank. Uh, but it could be a rich person, it could be a, a mutual fund. Um, it could be Kimberly Clark, they like to invest in these sorts of things. Uh, and then um, that finances, that sale of the tax credit itself finances the development. And that's our biggest supply of affordable housing today. And some of it is maintained and operated by a public housing authority. Um, some of it is maintained by a private landlord. Uh, most of it is. And then finally, we have policies to promote the demolition and sale of public housing. HUD's strategic plan is to eliminate all public housing in the next five years. And this has been an ongoing process. Um, what they mean by that is that it will be sold to investors, sometimes sold to the public housing authority itself. Um, so when I was in San Diego, the San Diego Public Housing Authority created a private for-profit developer that it controls. It sold all of its public housing stock to this entity, which was just an entity on paper, for $75 million. Then they used that to build new housing. Um, so that's part of this social structure of accumulation, right? Like we're changing the rules, uh, changing institutional structures to promote profit for investor class. Uh, all right, so, you know, that's sort of the close of my presentation. I have three kind of provocative questions. Do private property rights permit us to hunker down? Um, likewise, is mobility uh, are, are right for those stuck in place. Uh, so, you know, if, is mobility a right? Is the right to live in a neighborhood you want and choose the neighbors you want more of a right? Uh, what is the current crisis of capital? I've been alluding to this. Are we in a current crisis of capital? And if so, what is the new social structure of accumulation? And uh, could it mean massive investments in inner cities and in transportation, uh, but at what cost? With that, I will entertain any comments or queries. Peter, you're late for your next meeting. <laughs> i got three more minutes. Okay. Tell more about the social structure of accumulation. Um, so, in its, I, uh, I was hoping we would have. I was hoping Kahari Brown was here or David Fossenfest because I think they might know this better than I. Um, in its origins, uh, uh, many prominent scholars at Michigan helped develop this theory. And in its origins, the idea was um, if you looked at the market capitalization of publicly traded firms, you would see that after a market crash, there would be a tax structure change or a regulatory change. Um, and so if you think of the Great Depression um, after that, you saw a 
increase in the t taxes and you saw a change in trade policy um, and you also saw labor protections at the federal level and the idea the way that was sold to the investor class was that it would create stability that the social security would create a stability and that would allow business to continue with less risk and then so that's the example um, the way we're marrying that with, you know, instead of, you know, solely tax and trade policy, how that parallels shifts in social policy. Uh, but from what I've read and what uh, Mimi has read, um, the scholars who originated and continue to write about social structure of accumulation, they are not, uh, to them, social policy is a footnote more. You know, they might discuss it in passing, but it's not the main focus of what they're looking at. Um, so it's, it, it kind of goes back to, um, uh, I'm gonna say this wrong, there was a Russian economist, the Kondratin cycles, and the idea that um, there's a 50-year cycle of global economies of sort of rising and falling, um, and then governments have to respond. So there's a simplicity to social structure of accumulation that makes sense to me at least, but there's a lot of details underneath that, you know, you really have to work through the literature to kind of get an understanding of what that, uh, you know, some of the subtleties. Thank you, sir. Yes. Yeah, uh, first I want to clarify that uh, there's a, a very often a popular confusion as to the word of the meaning liberal. Yeah. Because most of us, at least those of us who date back to the 60s, yeah. associate liberal with uh, civil rights, with expansion of popular democracy, and that was in contrast to the word conservative. But liberal has often meant, like in the 19th century, and the word neoliberal, mm -hmm. which is applied to it, come from it, is really what conservatives stand for now, which is uh, free, to free market places with little government regulation, uh, everybody responsible for their own, and minimum social services. So that's where the 19th century liberal that Reagan plugged into, and then neoliberal is a return to that Whereas we think, oh, liberal, you know, bleeding heart liberal, you just want to save everybody welfare. No, that's the, uh, and now we're into a situation in which we're back to this equation, liberal versus, you know, welfare stuff versus conservative. And so there's a tradition in American history that um, really emphasizes those. Marco Rubio um, expressed the Republican ideology. So these are the tenets of Republican ideology. He did this in the 2016 uh, campaign. He said, first of all, we need a pro-business government. So pro-business means anything uh, that business needs, government should provide because business is good for America. It's the foundation of our democracy. Without business, you can't have anything else. But then he went down to, we also want small government, a small government, a small government providing for business, but anything that costs us money that's going to raise taxes, uh, that's going to provide support, the safety net that the New Deal created for, uh, for the poor, for the needy, for equalization. These people don't deserve it. They should be raising themselves up by the bootstraps. So we have to cut costs. And then the third one was uh, a strong military. So these are the, uh, and of course, military to provide for markets, and of course, implied is to suppress popular rights if necessary. And so I think that's, that's what this is up against. Right. Uh, just for clarification, now the other one thing that you said was that this is created by institutions and that in, in some sense popular opinion or popular movements may not uh, be as important, uh, or at least the, the idea. I mean, that's the thing. But uh, you, well, I'll let you answer uh, the, 
But the point is that institutions are driven by human beings mm -hmm. with ideologies. Mm -hmm. So if you get racist and capitalists involved in the institutional thing, it's really human beings who are driving the institutions. And they do reflect a constituency that's out there. They may have converted, or maybe they reflect, but that's... So I'll stop there for now. No, good point. Uh, thank you for bringing up it. it you, uh, because we live in an unusual political economy, the, the, it's always important to emphasize the different meanings of the word liberal in different contexts. I agree with you that institutions are run by people and that you know, they're shaped by the ideologies of those who have access to shape those institutions. Um, what you were describing or what you about Marco Rubio, that does sound like an articulation of this social structure of accumulation is to create a government that works for business. Uh, and I think that, that is very consistent. Um, on the issue of social movements, uh, what I was trying to articulate, and, and Mimi does it much better, is that there was, when the welfare state was expanding, um, that coincided with a rise in social movements. And those who write about social movements say, well, there were it was rising because the social movements were putting pressure on the institutions. Uh, and then the contraction of the welfare state is, coincides with attacks on social movements. Uh, and those attacks uh, on labor, things like right to work legislation, uh, or the, what do we say, right to work for less legislation. Um, <laughs> You know. Yeah. On your uh, first two questions, the, um, oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm just, I teach a course in policy analysis and uh, neoclassical economics and uh, you know market failure, government failure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I can't see any governmental interventions that would be acceptable to the American public. You know, this house will be sold only to uh, African American, this house will only be sold to a white person. Yeah. Where, where do those ideas come from? I, you know, it's going to, you know, the heavy head of government in, in that area, it's going to result in a loss in uh, consumer surplus. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, maybe that's worth doing, but what what kind of policies did you have in mind there? Uh, that's a good question. I think um, when it comes to uh, addressing residential segregation, the policy, and I didn't go over fair housing policy in depth, which I probably should have. Um, there are federal protections for housing discrimination, which is to say someone who, uh, if, you, if there's a, whether it's a real estate agent or a, uh, you know, uh, rental properties, there are federal protections that if someone is discriminated on the basis of race, there are mechanisms through HUD and sometimes through the states to uh, seek redress. And the, um, those lagged, uh, th those were very controversial uh, and took many decades to get through. I think those went in finally in 1968. Um, one thing HUD has been doing is to require that grantee cities plan for fair housing. Um, and maybe that's window dressing. Okay, we have a plan, we're gonna make sure there's no housing discrimination, and when we build new housing, we'll make sure it's marketed equitably and, and that sort of thing. Uh, there was a recent Supreme Court decision, I think it was two years ago, that the Supreme Court held that de facto segregation in a new development was actionable in the courts. Uh, the 
you didn't just have to intend to segregate. Uh, if, if it looked like segregation, then that was actionable. Um, in response, HUD started redrafting some of its fair housing enforcement regulations, and those have been put on hold by the Trump administration for two years so that, that grantees can get used to what those will be. Uh, so those are some of the policies kind of in the works. I, uh, I don't have, you know, a, I don't have a policy innovation for you other than, you know, but I, maybe you know, others in the room do. Like it's usually it's a subsidy on the subsidy side or on, on uh, HUD has a team of housing discrimination investigators. Uh, but well, is there broad public support for uh, fair housing? I would think there would. Be. I don't know. But, I doubt uh, it. But, really? Uh, I know there's not support. <laughs> there's you, you know the, the the Trump appointees have have not have been putting brakes on um, increased anti-discrimination policy. That I do know. Yeah. Yeah, just to continue the conversation, uh, I think there was a bubble between 19, World War II and 1975 in which the economy still was so prosperous that the rich could actually afford to share a bit of the pie with certain segments of the population. And since 75, there's been a reverse movement on that, and part of the what you were arguing was that uh, uh, that uh, there was a, uh, an idea that the, if you give the poor or the working or the middle class more resources, we'll make more business, and that sort of goes back to an older idea that merchants had that it's better to sell mass quantities at small prices and make super huge profits than to sell high value goods to a small population of nobles mm -hmm. and make smaller profits. So this has always been the, uh, the ruling philosophy of mercantile since they invented it. But I think what we're now seeing is that uh, it, there's always been, a, um, I would call it a reactive pro-civil rights, pro-citizenship movement to too much abuse. And so that, that happened that the social movements were actually not um, self-generated, they were generated by the opening created by this new attitude that we have to have a little bit more equality to create more prosperity. And so, uh, and now what's happened is that we have returned to the 19th century liberal, neoliberal view that uh, profits are the bottom line and it doesn't matter what happens to anybody else because they're responsible for themselves. And if they don't save themselves, they will, that, that's what they deserve. And this is, so it's basically, uh, uh, to really simplify it over human history, it's a, basically the, the, greed have, the greedy have control of government, have control of economics, have control of the whole system, and uh, uh, sometimes they have a conscience driven by profit, and sometimes they don't. And Trump right now is really the, not the uh, unique uh, uh, operation, but he's the ultimate consequence of a movement for profit uh, by the financial class. And now we've seen radically different uh, gas in wealth that go back even beyond 1929. So it sounds like you see the neoliberal age as we're still in it. Uh, it has now gotten beyond the neoliberal age. The neoliberal age, you could actually go back to and repair. Now it's all out war on the poor and even the middle class. Anybody who does not have power, that's too bad, you know? And, and you're seeing social movements now uh, of all kinds because of the civil rights movement. You actually had uh, two major movements for equal rights. One was the, uh, if you want to call it that, one was FDR's, you know, the welfare state. But then Johnson's Great Society pushed it over to where the money people cannot stand it anymore. This is too much. This is give away to people who don't deserve it. And Trump is the ultimate reaction to that, that people have been seething against that are prof profiting. But for a long time, it was not politically correct to criticize the giveaways 
the two parties still existed, but now it has been become open warfare. Trump has legitimized open warfare on those on, on the needy. Sorry about it, Pat. Any, any, any other questions, comments? Yeah. Okay. There's. Okay. There's. there's, there's, there's you, you oh, yes. Let's. I was thinking about the crisis of current crisis of capital and thinking about labor and land. So thinking about labor in terms of not having enough uh, talent, skills, bodies in certain areas where we need it, um, and having too much in areas where there are no longer any jobs. Um, thinking about land, uh, thinking about Detroit in particular, um, we have lots of land where we may not need it, and not enough land in the suburbs, for that, for example, where we may need it. So it's interesting that there's that sort of revolving door of activity around um, maximizing the the use and value of land. So thinking about Dan Gilbert as a pinnacle of you know uh, the investment class, we don't necessarily need. Um, racial covenants to keep certain folks out of certain neighborhoods. I think that that's done now, done now by income, but, and what folks are calling this sort of land, I'm rambling now, but what folks are sort of calling this uh, the land grab, I think is representative of this need for more land for, um, for typically rich, white, upper class, well-educated, um, people to now come back into the cities and create vibrancy, uh, which was lost when they left 30, 40, 50 years ago. So it uh, sounds like you're saying part of the social structure of accumulation is moving people and yeah. changing land tenure, land assembly uh, to maximize profits. Yes. Did, did you want to? Yeah, I said I agree with her. I took notes when you were talking about um, housing discrimination and fair housing for minorities. But like she said, I said that it's now they do it with income and tax bracket. You got to make a certain amount of money to live in this neighborhood. It doesn't matter what color you are, but it matters what color you are because by it's kind of a little bit harder for minorities to get the jobs that you need to be in that certain tax bracket to live in the suburb that you want to live in. So and then I also said that. Um, we talked about a lot about the Trump, but I was talking about presidents in general. They don't really show their support for something like fair housing or affirmative action as much as they could. Yeah, I think that's, uh, it has at best been a back burner issue. Um, I, I, you did remind me, um, there is one state, New Jersey, in response to a court case uh, called the Mount Laurel decision. Um, they were forced by the courts to address discrimination of housing on the basis of income. So every municipality in New Jersey has to have its fair share of affordable housing. So that every municipality has to have a certain percent. Yeah, that's, a, yeah. that's still somewhat discrimination. That's a certain percentage we gotta hit. Well, uh, I don't exactly them. remember how it, it, but the idea is that no, you can't put all the affordable housing in one municipality and then 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 there's municipalities that have only housing for the wealthy. That's what it was trying to prevent. A lot of uh, senators now they're trying to do that within the city, like make like twenty or thirty percent low income in the yeah. Richie condo. But did, does Bluefield Hills have a twenty percent affordability yeah. standard? Or <laughs> that's just point? Too. And that's, that's what's different between here and New Jersey, is that all the municipalities, at least on paper, have to have a fair share of affordable housing. There might be some other states that have done, maybe Maryland. Uh, but that, that's a state-level policy, even though it was uh, prompted by a court, federal court decision. Do you want to follow up? Well, the uh, question on mobility, uh, you know, this is Area's been running a regional transit for more than uh, 50 years, mm -hmm. and it would seem that if people living in Detroit could reach jobs in the suburbs, they would have the income to think about moving out into the suburbs. 
though, uh, you know, during the Great Recession, probably due to the high cost of Detroit, poor middle class residents, a lot of them moved out into the uh, suburbs. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, the affordability issue might be addressed with better regional transit. I agree. Um, I think Alan Goodman might have done some work on that. Uh, uh, just on, you know, the, the movement from city to suburbs in the past 10 years. Um, but I, you know, I, just speaking personally, I, we definitely need better transit in Detroit since I've lived in other places. <laughs> I saw some a hand over there somewhere. Mm -hmm. This one. No? Yeah. Do you want to follow up? Yeah, I want to follow up on the public transportation um, comment. Uh, let's say you improve public tra transportation. Let's be honest. Most Caucasian people don't really ride the bus. They have their own personal vehicle of transportation. Uh, so I think that's true generally. Just um, Detroit, well, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, Detroit's uh, the um, next wave of the National Transportation Survey is coming out soon, and then, then you actually get the current breakdown and you can do it by race of who rides transit to work and for trips and things. Um, yeah, personally, because I rode public transit, you see like... Sure, but you've ridden it here, right? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Right. <laughs> nationally, like, you know, I, I lived in D.C., I lived in, in San Francisco. Uh, you get more ridership from, from Caucasian people. Um, oh, well, it really wasn't about the public transportation. Yeah. It was more about the cost of owning your own personal vehicle. That too, yeah. Yeah, so I would say that, that, that let's say, okay, I'm black, I got a car, now I can't afford insurance because I don't have a job that will pay me enough to make insurance. Like, I have a car, I don't have insurance, I can't leave within the Detroit city limits, which means I can't move to the suburbs, and if I do, go outside of Detroit city limits, I have a risk of getting my car towed <laughs> or anything of that matter, not because I can't necessarily afford it, because if I move to the suburbs, I get cheaper insurance, it's just like a catch-22. Yeah. So I'm like, if you improve public transportation, would I use it to get to the suburbs where I would have no car because I can't afford insurance? It's, it's hard. <laughs> I don't know. Well, it's also that, um Improving transportation to the suburbs for inner city people is really a choice be to, between two options. One is no jobs in the city and working at a Burger King in the suburbs or doing, you know, so the, the, you get more pay, but mm -hmm. it's really poverty level, below poverty level still. So you're actually putting out a great effort to just keep from not working, you know, not having an income. And so it's really... Uh, uh, the system maintains the poverty level of certain groups. And I think the social structure of uh, what accumulation, accumulation yeah. uh, I mean, that just basically gets down to what is the basic principle of all business is to make a profit. And then regulated business, either by government or by the values of the profiteer, is moderated to say, okay, I got to give something back sure. to an employee or to the community, but I'm re not really required by that unless I'm forced by the federal government, state government, or, or local government. So you really need uh, progressive, that's I guess another word, progressive legislation that says that you know we owe all, all owe something to the communities in which we operate a business. Okay. Thank you.